This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. When I was a kid, I watched a lot of cartoons, and one of my favorite cartoons in the 80s was G.I. Joe. Anybody ever watch G.I. Joe cartoons? Some, some of my contemporaries, okay. Uh, so G.I. Joe always had a normal episode, and then at the end of the episode, there was always a 30-second PSA, okay? And the PSA was always a public service announcement, like, you know, if you fall on thin ice, here's how you help somebody off the ice, right? Stuff like that. And at the end, the, the, kind of a, a common theme in all of these was um, a group of kids gets involved in something. They don't really kind of think through what they're doing. They're just doing stuff. And then there's a crisis. Then a G.I. Joe figure shows up and talks to them, explains to them what they should be doing. And at the end, they always said, anybody else knows that they can say it with me, Oh, thanks, G.I. Joe figure. Now I know. And knowing is half the battle. Okay, fantastic. Love it. Um, so knowing is half the battle. So uh, how the heck is that going to relate to our Bible? Um, I, I think that we, uh, every time we come together on a Sunday morning, um, we go through a kind of a similar routine of what happens in our worship service. And I think sometimes we kind of just go through it. Right? We don't think carefully about what we're doing or why we're doing it. We just always say this prayer after that hymn, and we just kind of roll on. And I think there's something really important about knowing why we do what we do. Uh, and today's a great day to reflect on that because we changed everything up. Right? But even as we changed it up, I, I want to point out how similar our normal service is to what we've been doing today. Um, and, and I hope we'll figure out that half of our battle is knowing why we worship the way we worship, and then we'll talk about the other half in a minute. So um, I really hate it when pastors use PowerPoints in their sermons, <laughs> but um, I, I have a, a, just a, a brief PowerPoint because I need some audience participation. And I thought you might feel more comfortable if there was something on the screen, all right? So just go to my first slide. All right. I, I want you to think, not today, but on a normal Sunday, how does our worship usually begin? Um, now, this is totally unfair if you're a first-time guest. Just hold on. We're getting to you in a minute. Um, but what do we normally do first? We do announcements, right? Um, and then after announcements, what do we normally do? Anybody remember? A call to worship. There's a call to worship. Excellent. Followed by... Oh, before the confession, what do we do between call to worship and confession? I heard it, a hymn, right? We, this is my, I don't, that was singing, I don't know what that was. Okay. Um, yeah, we, we, be, we begin with, with music, right? Um, our, our idea there is that when we come into the presence of God, our first response is praise, right? The first thing that happens when we encounter God is we praise Him, we sing. Right? Um, this is exactly what happens in Isaiah chapter 6. Right, so Isaiah comes into the temple, he is shocked, all of a sudden God appears before him, and there's angels flying around, and what's the first thing that happens? The angels start singing praise to God. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, heaven and earth are filled with his glory. Right? So our first reaction to the presence of God when we come to worship is we praise. What's the very next thing that we do? Somebody already said it. What do we do after we sing a hymn normally? We confess our sins, right? Um, and, and, and this is really important. When we see God, when we see how great and amazing and glorious God is, our first reaction is, wow. And our second reaction is, oh dear. Because I'm not like that, right? I mean, the, the grace and the mercy and the, the patience and the kindness that I see in God, I don't see in me. Uh, and so, again, exactly what happens with Isaiah, right? Isaiah hears, sees God, and they hear the praise to God, and what does he say? Woe is me, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live amongst the people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the Lord. And then we say a prayer of confession, um, and then after our prayer of confession, what do we do? There's a weird part in here. What, what do we do after the prayer of confession? Okay, excellent. There's a silent time where we can confess our own personal sins. And then, 
Yeah, somebody said assurance of pardon, right? Forgiveness, right? Assurance of pardon. Um, we say, hey, you've been forgiven, right? Not because of what we've done, but because of what, not because of what you've done, not because your prayer was persuasive to God, but because of what Christ has already done for you. Again, the same thing happens with Isaiah, right? Woe am I, uh, woe, woe to me. And then the angel comes. Isaiah doesn't do anything. And the angel takes a, a coal from the altar and he touches his lips. And he says, your sin's forgiven. Uh, and, and then what do we do right after we do our, um, uh, our assurance of pardon? We sing something. Well, it, it, it's got a Latin name. The Gloria Patri. You guys are awesome today. Okay, the, the Gloria Patri, right? We, 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 we sing to God. Why? Because now we have a whole new reason to worship God, right? Not just that God is holy and, and amazing and powerful and beautiful and good, but also He has forgiven us. Um, by the way, our service, our 6 o'clock service that we've been doing this morning is structured exactly the same way, right? We come... We encounter the presence of God, we begin to sing praises to Him, and then we pause, and in the midst of praising God, we realize how sinful and broken we are. And Dan Frost got up here, as we will do every single week, and he said a prayer of confession for us, right? And after he prayed his prayer of confession, he reminded us of the forgiveness we have in Jesus Christ. And then we had another reason to sing, so we sang again, right? You, you see how all that comes together? So all of this is really, really important. I already forgot that there's a, I forgot there was a PowerPoint. Anyway, you guys are doing great up there. Um, I'm having a lot of fun this morning. Uh, so all of that is designed to get us ready to hear from God, okay? All of that stuff that we do at the beginning of our service, um, which ex- happens to Isaiah when he encounters God, all of that is to get us ready. Do you notice that until... Isaiah's sin is forgiven and he's reconciled with God. He never hears God speak. The angels speak. God doesn't speak until after all of that is over. And when all of that preparation is over, Isaiah is finally ready to hear from God. So we have a a preparation part of our service where we get ready to hear from God. Uh, And then we do try to hear from God, right? And we have two ways we do that. Um, The first is the what we call the word of the Lord. What's the word of the Lord? Yeah, the, the, the Bible, right? The Old New Testament. You, you, you got one in your pew, maybe in your hand. And every week I say the word of the Lord and you say, thanks be to God, right? So um, the, the, the word of the Lord, I think that's pretty clear that that's from God. Um, but we have a really weird idea in our tradition. And, and the weird idea is that proclaiming the word of the Lord is also kind of the word of the Lord. Uh, l- l- let, me, let me say it the way um, the second Helvetic confession says, which is a, a 15th century document in our Presbyterian constitution. It says, we believe and confess the canonical scriptures of the holy prophets and apostles of both testaments to be the true word of God and to have sufficient authority of themselves, not of men. For God spoke himself, spoke to the fathers, prophets, apostles, and still speaks to us through the Holy Scriptures. Okay, so the word of the Lord, right? And then it says, wherefore, when this word of God is now preached in the church by preachers lawfully called, we believe that the very word of God is proclaimed and received by the faithful, and that neither any other word of God is to be invented nor is to be expected from heaven, and that now the word itself which is preached is to be regarded, not the minister that preaches. For even if he be evil and a sinner, nevertheless, the word of God remains still true and good. This is a really interesting idea. Uh, Our whole service is structured around, you know, getting ready for the sermon, right? The sermon's the longest, the longest part. And we believe that somehow in the preaching we hear the Word of God. Um, This is, by the way, not at all to say that what the pastor says is equally important to what the Bible says. But it is to say that the Bible is meant to be talked about. The Bible is meant to be proclaimed. The Bible is meant to be applied to our lives. There was a guy named Karl Barth who said that every time a pastor enters the pulpit, he or she ought to have the Bible in one hand and the newspaper in another. And the idea was, if this 
doesn't relate to your regular life, then it's not doing you any good. And if you're living your regular life without the benefit of the wisdom of God, then you're in a tight spot. Uh, but if we can bring those two together, um, somehow we experience the Word of God the way it's meant to be experienced. This is what Paul tells Timothy. Paul tells Timothy, proclaim the Word. Be persistent whether the time is favorable or unfavorable. Convince, rebuke, and encourage with the utmost patience and teaching. When he says proclaim the word, the, the Greek for word is logos, right? It's not um, a word, it's the word. Like in the beginning was the logos, and the logos was with God, and the logos was God. He was in the beginning with God. Paul's saying, um, I want you to take the story of Jesus and go talk about it. And in talking about it, you're doing the work of proclaiming the word. So um, in Isaiah, uh, Isaiah finally gets to hear from God. He finally gets to hear the word of the Lord. And the word is, who shall I send and who will go for me? And then the last part of our service happens um, because Isaiah, what does he do? What does he say? You might remember? Here I am, right? Here am I. Send me. He responds to the word. Um, knowing is half the battle, but the other half is doing, right? That you can't just hear the word of the Lord and then do nothing with it. So normally on a Sunday, we do a lot of things to respond to the word in our worship service. And just put my whole list up there. Um, so we don't, I'm not going to go through all these, but we ask questions, right? Which you'll see if you keep reading in Isaiah, he asks some questions of God. We praise God. We pray for others. We receive the Holy Spirit. We're going to do that in a minute in our sacrament of communion. We give back to God our treasure and our time. We profess our faith. Um, and, and we are commissioned to ministry. And I want to particularly focus on that last one, um, that part of our response is that we're commissioned to ministry. See, I think all of this stuff about how our worship service is structured is really interesting. Um, but... But it's also really critically important for your life this week because you are called to be the people that proclaim the word of God to your neighbors and family members and friends. Paul's not just talking to Timothy when he says go and preach the word. He's talking to every believer. Uh, it's not just seminary trained people who can take the Bible and, and, and preach it and, and share it and touch people's lives with it, that's your job. That's your job as a believer. Uh, now, I totally get it when you want to say, hey, yeah, but Jim, I, you know, I, I'm not sure I'm the right guy for that job. That sounds really scary. Um, but we just went through this whole process where you were made clean by Jesus. Right? We just went through this whole process where you recognized your faults and confessed them, and God forgave you, and God decided that you were worthy for him to speak to well, okay, yeah, but I, I'm still learning. I mean, I, I heard the word of the Lord, but I'm not sure how to handle that, and there's a lot more of the word of the Lord I haven't read yet. And um, sure, okay, that's fine. We'll start learning. That's good. Um, but don't let perfect be the enemy of good. God's not calling you to go out and preach a 45-minute sermon on the street corner. Um, those aren't super effective anyway. He's simply calling you um, to take the spiritual truth you know and lovingly touch somebody's life with it. Uh, this happens in all kinds of ways. Um, some expected, but usually unexpected. Uh, I, I've been sharing a little bit about this, this book I really enjoyed this summer, The Age of Opportunity, a, a biblical guide to parenting teens. Um, and uh, Paul David Tripp is the author, and he talks a little bit about um, how these moments where we're called to preach the word sneak up on us, and they especially sneak up on us when we're dealing with teenagers. So he says, um, one morning I was just minding my business when I turned around from the kitchen counter to find my son standing there. Before I had a chance to greet him, he said, Dad, what do you think of my ears? What do I think of your ears, I thought. I hadn't really been thinking about his ears. I hadn't thought about his ears ever. Uh, but all of a sudden, he was very serious about his ears. He could tell I was hesitating. So... I wanted to say something quasi-intelligent. So I said, well, what do you think of them? I've never been particularly opinionated about ears. I don't notice them in the mall. I've never prayed, God, thank you for the beautiful set of ears you've given me. I don't know what I would have done if they'd been like so-and-sos. 
Yet all of a sudden, without warning, I was in a very serious discussion about ears. My son had been looking in the mirror that morning, hoping he had grown to look more like a normal human being when he saw his ears and they didn't seem to fit his head. I tried to talk about the majesty of God's creative ability and the technology of ears, but he wasn't listening. He said, but dad, they're just sort of stuck on the sides of your head. They hang out so far. What do you do with them? Mine don't fit my head. They're so embarrassing and I'm stuck with them for life. That morning I talked longer about ears than I have before or have since. These are the moments where you're called to preach the word. These are the moments where you're called to take the truths that you know about who Christ is and who he calls us to be and touch the lives of the people around you with them. I had a conversation with a teacher this week um, who was back in school and um, it was one of the teacher work days and she went into another teacher's classroom and if you think kids are stressed out before school starts, you know, you got no idea how stressed out teachers are. And she went into this other teacher's classroom and, and this other teacher was just freaking out. And she said, um, I, think, I think we need to pause. Can I say a prayer for you? And the other teacher said, oh my gosh, that'd be great. Would you close the door? And they closed the door and they had a time of prayer. It wasn't elaborate. It wasn't in Greek or Hebrew, right? It was just a prayer. And afterwards, her friend said, I cannot believe how much better I feel. Why don't I ever think of doing that? Your job is to proclaim the word. And, and simple ways to take the Bible and the newspaper of people's lives and bring them together. Uh, a simple way we're asking you to do that this week is just to invite somebody to worship, right? When you leave, you'll get these little invitation cards. And they're really simple. You rip one off, you give one away, and you invite somebody to come worship with us next week. I think we are so intimidated about preaching the word because we think it requires all these qualifications and classifications that we don't have. But all it really requires is one simple ability, uh, a willingness to respond to God's word and to speak. I have a little video that captures this I'm going to share. You don't have a ton of things in common with God, but there is one thing. You speak. So does he. God spoke light into existence with his words. I wonder what you could speak into existence with your words this week. I wonder what kind of love you could speak into your marriage that feels like it's in neutral. I wonder what kind of courage you could speak into the heart of a child who's hurting. I wonder what kind of peace you could speak into your broken friendship. What kind of hope you could speak into your own weary soul. I want you to know that the most powerful words you're going to speak this week is probably not going to be on a stage or a conference call or closing the deal with a client that you want. The most powerful words you're going to speak is probably just with one or two people listening, maybe zero. It's totally possible that the most powerful sentence you'll say this week is a thoughtful text message that you send to a friend who's walking through the valley of the shadow of death. It's the apology email that you finally get the courage to send. It's the whispered prayers through tears in the middle of a dark night. Powerful words aren't just for preachers who stand behind pulpits. They're for parents who stand next to bunk beds. Speak life to their kids. For spouses who share hopes and dreams during pillow talk, and not criticism. For teenagers who stand up to bullies, stand up for the uncool kids. Your tongue is so small, but so powerful. Your tongue is telling a story. God has already given you everything you need to tell his story. So listen again for Paul's instructions to Timothy, but hear them as his instructions to you. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing in his kingdom, I solemnly urge you, proclaim the word, 
Be persistent, whether the time is favorable or unfavorable. Convince, rebuke, and encourage with the utmost patience in teaching. Thanks be to God. Amen.